thank you, Andrea, and the introduction. Um, I, I, I'm a professor of digital filmmaking here at NTU at the School of Art, Design, and Media, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. What I teach is documentary filmmaking. My uh, academic and my professional specialty is making science documentaries. And one of the things that I was thinking about in relationship to this Heritage Conference is that um, it's very important in making science documentaries to be accurate to the content, to find a way to be accurate and present the real material in the same way that it's very important to present cultural material, cultural heritage in an accurate way. And I, was, uh, I have a way of expressing what I do in my filmmaking, and I've recognized that um, every film is, a, is an abbreviation of real time and real space, and it's an illusion of reality. And that phrase, illusion of reality, comes from the fact that in my childhood background, besides being an actor acting in uh, costumed movies that my father made about historical uh, events in the United States, I was also a working magician as a child from the time I was five till the time I was 16. And I want to show you an illusion. And here's a Singapore coin, but it's too small to use in this huge environment. So I actually have a cultural artifact in my pocket. This is a California river rock from my childhood. And everybody watch, this is, this is what I do. Okay? An illusion, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look, watch, it's right there. No, I don't have rocks in my head. But that, that's an illusion, I've been doing that illusion since I was five years old over and over and over. And I find that what we need to be thinking about often in doing all kinds of cultural and science presentations is being very accurate to the reality and finding a way to create a presence for the participants, especially modern participants, to be involved in the cultural artifacts that we are showing and we are thinking about. Um, for this morning's panels, I had the pleasure of meeting one of the speakers through his book early on, and I did some research and I found that all five of the speakers have published books. And their backgrounds and their bios and their academic connections are all listed in this book in, a, in, our, in our program, and I would urge you to take a look at it. But I would like to use the books along the way. And our first speaker is uh, Seymour Zeki, and I found this is one of his books, which was in our library. And the title is Splendors and Miseries of the Brain. It's a wonderful title. Love, Creativity, and the Quest for Human Happiness. So Professor Zeki is a brain specialist working in this, I love the title of his, his area, Neuroaesthetics. And as I was looking through the, excuse me, the table of contents, abstraction of the brain, the brain and its concepts, brain concepts and ambiguity, uh, ambiguity in the brain and in art, unachievable brain concepts, and there's this whole section, Michelangelo and the non-finito, Paul Cezanne and the unfinished, unfinished art and literature. I just love the titles along the way here. And then there's another section, brain concepts of love, Wagner and Tristan and Solda, Thomas Mann and Death in Venice, and the last chapter, a neurobiological analysis of Freud's civilization and discontents. Quite a range along the way. Um, on the back, one of the reviews says, this book is not about what neuroscience reveals about love and about art, but it is about what love and art reveal about the brain. This book reveals the intimate relationship between the fundamental function of the brain and the highest of human experiences. How's that for an introduction? Very well. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Seymour Ziki. Uh, Chairman, thank you very much for your. Um, you I'm fine. Thank you very much for your. So, thanks a lot for your very elegant introduction. Uh, Andrea, thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for turning up at this unseemly hour to hear something about beauty. Now, this is a meeting about heritage. And I am going to be addressing the question of heritage, but in a very different context. I'm not going to be talking about any particular heritage, but I'm going to be talking about the biological heritage, which allows each and every one of us, regardless of our ethnic or cultural upbringing, to experience beauty. So the talk is really about beauty. But let me just say one or two things about that. We are sometimes unfairly accused, and I use the term accused uh, advisedly, that we are addressing the question of beauty, of what beauty is. Well, we're not doing that. That's far too difficult a topic for us. What we are addressing is the question of what are the neural mechanisms 
that allow people of all races, all mankind, to experience beauty. It is a question which is biologically legitimate. It is as legitimate as asking the question, what are the neural mechanisms that allow us to, exp uh, to experience color or form? So that's one issue which I would like to get across. The second point uh, I would like to emphasize is that people often think of beauty <coughs> as a subjective experience, which of course it is. But the way in which the term subjective is used makes it sound as if it is sub subordinate to the objective reality. And that is not so, because the only reality, the only truths that you can be sure of are the ones that your brain allows you to experience. There is no other reality. I can show you uh, a lot of illusions and tell you that they are illusions, but your brain sees them that way because that's the way the brain is organized. So you can be sure that you love somebody. You can be sure that you find something beautiful. But you cannot be sure that anybody else finds it beautiful. And you can't be sure even that your lover loves you in return. And the third point which I'd like to make is a point which has been made emphatically by philosophers, and above all by Schopenhauer, uh, who wrote a book on color vision. And I want to quote to you a passage from that book, which I think is a very important passage. He says, a better understanding and a firmer conviction of the wholly subjective nature of color is a very good introduction to the Kantian doctrine of the likewise subjective intellectual forms of all knowledge and hence serves as a very good introductory course to philosophy because the problem of philosophy is largely the problem of uh, knowledge, how we acquire it, and how sure we are of what we know. Well, there is one thing which you can be sure of, and that is your subjective experience. So having said that, let me just address now the, for the rest of the lecture a single question, which is what are the neural mechanisms uh, that allow us to experience beauty? Although we are not humanists. We are nevertheless deeply inspired by the writings in the humanities. And very often, because they have thought about this, these issues for much longer than we have, you see, very often what they write is an inspiration for the design of paradigms uh, for testing. Now, here is a statement from Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irish uh, uh, philosopher politician, who, who gave this definition of beauty. Beauty is, for the greater part, some quality in bodies acting mechanically upon the human mind by the intervention of the senses. If you look at that definition, you'll find that two-thirds of it is directly related to the brain. And this is not coming from me. So the quality in bodies, that's the physical quality, the human mind, which I equate largely with the human brain, and the intervention of the senses, which is, of course, entirely the brain. So. <clears throat> Let us, uh, with that definition in the background, let us look at what a, a, uh, a, I think a great art historian, art critic said, Clive Bell. Clive Bell was an English art critic, better known as the husband of Vanessa Bell, who was a very good English painter. And he tried to find what is common to all things that we experience as beautiful. He wrote in his book, Art Published in 1914, which I recommend, said, what is common uh, in the uh, uh, Santa Sophia in Istanbul, the uh, windows at Chart Cathedral in France, a Mexican sculpture, uh, Chinese bowl, Persian carpets, the frescoes of Giotto at Padua, and the masterpieces of Poussin Piera da Francesca and Cezanne. This is his list, not mine. So he said, if you can tell me what is common in all of these things, then you have essentially solved the problem of aesthetics. This is him saying it, not me. Now, you notice that he is uh, using only visual beauty. He's not talking about uh, musical beauty. And beauty has, on the whole, been written off in abstract terms when Hume or Plato uh, or Schopenhauer can't talk about beauty. They do not talk specifically about musical or visual beauty. They also talk about uh, poetics and, and, and literature and, and much else besides. 
So we wanted to address the question of the experience of beauty. And secondly, to uh, quote Clive Bell again, he says, you must find in the, what is, where the experience of beauty what is common to all and peculiar to none. Therefore, we, uh, I live in London, and London is one of the world's great uh, uh, multicultural cities. We've got people from all backgrounds, uh, racial, uh, ethnic, and cultural. But we avoided having anyone who was knowledgeable about art, no art students, no artists, no musicians, and no music students. And thirdly, um, you find that uh, Clive Bell is doing what people accuse us of doing. He's confusing, or no, he's not, not, not confusing, he's equating beauty with art. Uh, well, we don't do that because we are aware that um, the connection between beauty and art has always been tenuous, but it was bl brutally severed by Marcel Duchamp uh, when he sent a urinal to an exhibition, to an art exhibition in New York, and said that I would sue you if you do not uh, uh, exhibit this. So what do we do? We get uh, people from all races and backgrounds and give them 360 paintings representing landscapes, still lives, uh, uh, abstract art, uh, portraits, and get them to classify these into uh, roughly beautiful, indifferent, neutral, and ugly. And we get them to listen to th uh, uh, equal numbers of, of musical excerpts, and they classify these as well. And then after two weeks, they come back to the lab, to the scanner, and they sit in the scanner. They are re-shown these uh, slides, and they reclassify these uh, excerpts or the st visual stimuli after each one is seen or heard. Now, um, let me give you examples of so, so each person decides for himself or herself which, are the, uh, which ones they experience as beautiful and which ones they experience as ugly or neutral. Uh, we don't impose at all. We don't tell them this is beautiful. So this painting by Ang was classified uh, as beautiful by most, not all, but by most uh, subjects. And um, next one, which is a painting by Sigmund, by, not Sigmund, by Lucien Freud, uh, was classified as ugly by most. Now, here's the problem. You see, this is a painting which is, in fact, considered to be a fabulous painting and is worth many millions of pounds. And it certainly is a great work of art because it projects truths of decadence and decay and corpulence. But it was not experienced as beautiful by the great majority of those who took part in the experiment. With music, this next piece was experienced as beautiful by all. <laughs> From, from Mahler's Fifth Symphony, and this next one by Ligeti. Uh, this was experienced as ugly by all. This does not mean to say again that it does not ha have high uh, musical and artistic merit, but it was not perceived as beautiful, which is what we, are, we were interested in. Let me just, for those who, who are perhaps uh, not uh, very conversant with the methods of, of imaging, uh, when brain areas are especially active, the, uh, their metabolic requirement increases because the cells respond uh, far more rapidly and uh, uh, with a greater frequency, and so more blood is channeled to these parts, and the cameras around the head detect the difference between the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood and locate it in particular parts of the brain, and that's how you infer that there's activity in that part of the brain. And if you look at the pattern of activity in the brain when people are looking at pictures, uh, you find there's, there's a lot of activity. Uh, let's see if I can do it here on this. Uh, you, you, is, 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 this a, is this a pointer? Uh, no? 
well, the, the white area at the back is the visual cortex. So this is the area stimulated when they were looking at the visual stimuli. And the green part is the auditory cortex, which is stimulated when they were listening to music. When, however, you look at the areas of the brain which are active when they experience the stimuli as beautiful, then you find that there is one area situated here in front in the media orbital frontal cortex, a part of the emotional brain, which is very active with visual beauty. Right? And when you look at the parts of the brain which are active with uh, musical beauty, you find that the same part of the brain there, now shown in green, is active with musical beauty. When people experience beauty uh, in excerpt as being beautiful, and if you look at the conjunction between the two, uh, you have this area that is not complete overlap, but this is area, this area in, in the, of the emotional brain is active when people experience musical or visual beauty. So we can now answer the question of Clive Bell in a different way. What is common to all and peculiar to none in experiencing experience of beauty? We can say, well, we can't tell you about what's common to all in the objects that they see or the musical excerpts that they listen to, but we can tell you that what is common to all and peculiar to none when they experience beauty is activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex of the brain. Moreover, we can also say, and it's a big question in the philosophies of aesthetics, can aesthetic judgments ever be measured? And the answer is yes, because the, uh, if you look at the medial orbital frontal cortex with visual beauty, you find that the activity there is much greater with beautiful stimuli than with ugly stimuli. So it is a parametrically uh, determined relationship. It's measurable and quantifiable. And if you look at uh, musical beauty, you find much the same relationship. So <clears throat> when I was uh, lecturing in Chicago uh, some four or five years ago, a very well-meaning young man got up and said, Professor, you know, beauty is subjective. Uh, science deals with quantification. Uh, and I thought my response to him was that you are right, but only partly right, and therefore you're wrong because science does not deal with quantification. Science deals with curiosity. And as it happens, since you're bringing up the question of quantification, here is my answer. It can be quantified. And in fact, you can quantify uh, these things in a much greater detail than I have shown you here. Now, with ugly stimuli, a different part of the brain is active. It is the motor cortex shown up to the right there. And then the areas in yellow, uh, which is the amygdala, which is also active with uh, with fear. And again, the, the uh, activation there is parametrically related to the declared intensity of ugliness. So again, it is quantifiable. And this raises an interesting question. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, tell you that the brain seems to have developed special pathways to deal with aesthetic judgments. For example, if you were to take stimuli, two stimuli, not ask people you find this beautiful or not. But instead, you ask them to compare which of the two is more beautiful or which of the two is brighter, the latter being a cognitive judgment and the former an aesthetic judgment. You find that there are special areas of the brain devoted to uh, aesthetic judgments and other areas which are devoted to both cognitive and aesthetic judgments. I don't want to burden you too much with names, but these are the areas of the brain which are involved with both aesthetic and cognitive judgments. And these are the areas of the brain which are involved with aesthetic judgments alone. And you will see that the medial orbital frontal cortex there, MOFC, and the lateral orbital frontal cortex, are, and the amygdala, are all engaged in aesthetic judgments. Now, oh, OK. Now, uh, so, so, so uh, this is just to point out that there are, there's a, there are pathways for aesthetic judgments alone, which include the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, the medial and lateral orbital frontal cortex most prominently. And there are other areas which are shared, both aesthetic and, and uh, is it working? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, which are shared by both um, 
aesthetic and cognitive judgments. All of this uh, raises a very interesting neurobiological problem. And again, I'm anxious to emphasize that I am not a humanist and I'm not a philosopher. I'm a neurobiologist. I'm really interested in the problems of the brain. So one problem in the brain is um, each area of the brain, of the cortex, has got multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And the question is to decide to, to learn what are the factors that regulate that an output from an area is engaged or not engaged. If you look, this is just a schematic drawing. Uh, this is yeah, the primary visual cortex. And if you look at when, uh, and which, which has multiple outputs, if you look at beautiful uh, bodies, you of course activate the primary visual cortex. You activate the areas which are critical for the perception of bodies, and there are such areas. But if it is beautiful, you then activate the medial orbital frontal cortex. If it is ugly, you share the common pathways here, but you activate the amygdala. So something here is regulating what uh, outputs are engaged from, this, uh, from the multiple outputs from this area. Well, there are reasons to believe that uh, there are certain templates, certain structures that the brain accepts and others that the brain rejects. So there is something uh, about the physical quality of the stimuli that is important, not perhaps critical, but important, or perhaps critical, but not uh, exclusive, in qualifying something as beautiful or not. A man who, who capitalized on that was actually Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon's work has been described as images from hell. Uh, and you know, uh, the latest uh, writing on him, which I read, which was nine, uh, uh, 2012 in The Guardian, is, talked about his depiction of private hells. I would like you to uh, listen, first of all, to what Francis Bacon's intention was in uh, I want to give me a shock. Now, shock, you could say, is a form of expression. But what expression it is, I don't know. It's a visual shock. It's not, it's not a, a shock about, um, it's not a, a shock that you could get from a story. It's, a, it's just a, a, a visual shock. So his aim was to give a visual shock. And to do that, what he achieved was to subvert the brain's normal representation of faces and bodies. So he made it entirely emotional and took away all the cognitive side. And he says so in his own words. Because I made images that intellect would never make. So the intellect cannot make these images. It has to be emotional. And what did he come up with? Uh, images like this. But I want you to notice that the deformation and the subversion is of the bodies and the faces alone. The objects are recognizable easily. Okay, So he, he um, uh, hinged his whole uh, uh, way of giving a shock on deforming what the brain would recognize as a normal body. Before it can even attribute beauty to it, it has got to have normality. We have tried to study this in a different way. So we're now addressing the first part of Burke's question, some quality in bodies. So let's address it in a very, very simple way. Let's address it with kinetic art. There is an area of the brain that is specialized for visual motion. When that area is damaged, subjects just do not see motion anymore. And when uh, they will see this object of my hand, but if my hand starts moving, it just disappears. Uh, it's a uh, the syndrome of akinetopsia. And what we thought we'd do is to get subjects, again, from all nationalities and races and so on, and get the computer to generate kinetic stimuli, so we are out of it, to totally as objective as can be, um, and let the subjects view these different stimuli and rate them according to preference. And this is the stimulus which most, if not most, all of them preferred, 21 subjects. Um, and the same dots, when set in motion like this, were, uh, were, were non-preferred by all subjects. 
And now, if you look at the activity in the brain, when people look at the preferred stimuli, kinetic stimuli, and the non-preferred ones, you find that the activity is located in, the, in V5, which is the area which is critical for motion. And it is parametrically related to the uh, declared preference. And also, in the medial orbital frontal cortex, an activity here is also parametrically related to the declared preference for the kinetic stimuli. Hence, there is some quality, because the, these kinetic stimuli can be specified with respect to direction of motion, speed of motion, uh, size of dots, their luminance, and so on. Uh, there is some uh, relationship between the physical quality of the stimulus uh, in the kinetic stimuli, just as in a more abstract sense and, uh, and speculatively, the, there is a relationship which people like Francis Bacon capitalized on between the physical quality of a stimulus and whether you can say it is beautiful as a stimulus. Uh, now, when philosophers of aesthetics, Kant and Schopenhauer and Burke and uh, Earl of Shaftesbury and others talk about beauty, they always talk about beauty and the sublime. This is an interesting distinction. Um, sublime is, uh, the, 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 the origins of the sublime go back to uh, a Greek philologist of doubtful existence by the name of Longinus, and therefore also known as Pseudo-Longinus, who actually spoke about the sublime in language. But by the time of the English Enlightenment in the uh, 18th century, the sublime was, uh, was shifted to uh, scenes of natural grandeur, the Mount Everest and Mont Blanc, uh, the, the gales in the Atlantic and the, uh, the vastness of the desert. Um, and this became the idea of the sublime. But the sublime is a very different, difficult category to define because it unites two different things. It is, as Kant would say, it is pleasure derived from displeasure, beauty from fear. Right? So it is critical for anyone looking at beauty to, to address the question of what is sublime? Uh, what, what, what happens in the brain when you experience something as sublime? And here is an example of a stimulus which is which is sublime. This is from the United States. And again, you take your subjects of all races and show them these slides and it, it let them declare how sublime they find them to be. The restriction, of course, is that this is done in a scanner. It would be very different if you put them there, if you had a, sort of a portable scanner. And here's another uh, 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 slide of, of something which is uh, uh, sublime. It is basically described as something that's created in the mind. That's what um, uh, Kant and Burke described as something created in the mind. And um, distinct from beauty, it is grand, as opposed to beauty, which is small. And if you get subjects then to look at these sublime stimuli, you find a pattern of activity in the brain. Oh, well, first of all, let me just say that the relationship, because you also ask them, how beautiful is it? The relationship of the sublime and the beautiful is, is uh, uh, so here it is, sublimity and beauty. So there is a good correlation there, uh, but there is a very uh, negative correlation between sub sublimity and size, just as the philosophers of aesthetics predicted, and then a sort of a very tenuous uh, relationship between what is sublime and what is pleasant. Because sublime has never been described as pleasant. It is, it is pleasure derived from displeasure, as Immanuel Kant described it. So if you look at the areas of the brain which are active, you find that you've got a very different pattern of activity now. I'm not going to go through all these areas because it's just taxing your memory unnecessarily. But a, the medial orbital frontal cortex is not active. Instead, an area which is superior to it is active. The visual areas, of course, are active. And then there is the, 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 the head of the caudate as opposed to the body, which is active with, with beauty. And then there are various areas which are deactivated. It is, um, linguistically, it, it, it's, it's very difficult, actually, for, for us uh, to, to fit this into a brain pattern because, uh, because of the deficiency of the language. There is no word. The word sublime in, uh, includes so many different facets. See, it's fear, it's awe, it's pleasure, it's excitement, but it's also the infinite. Uh, and so 
the sublime includes all these things. Even if you take one word, such as fear, uh, the fear on a face is very, very different from the fear that you might uh, imagine when you're looking at uh, thunder and lightning from the safety of a house. Uh, so the, our linguistic system is, is rather deficient in giving a very precise definition of the sublime. But in terms of neurobiology, in terms of neuro, the neurophysiology, the, the distinction is very clear. The pattern of activity in the brain is very distinct from that of the experience of the beautiful. And the last, last few words of uh, Edmund Burke in his book on the origin of the uh, on a philosophical inquiry on the origin of our experience of sublime and beautiful. He says, from all that has been said, the sublime is very distinct from the beautiful. One is grand, the other one is small. So, now, Immanuel Kant, of course, wrote the, uh, his book, The Critique of Judgment, which is entirely devoted to aesthetics. And in that, he addressed the question of the sublime as well. And he said that the ability to experience, to, to, to think of, the, of infinity as a whole gives a mental power which surpasses any standard of sense. All right. So it was interesting for us to go to the next issue, which is um, what happens in the brain when people experience mathematical beauty? which, of course, always includes, but not always, but often includes the infinite. And, of course, mathematicians always delight. They say, look, um, uh, there is something wonderful about uh, beauty. Uh, Bertrand Russell said uh, uh, mathematics, properly regarded, uh, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. And so we thought we would now address the question of what happens in our brains when we experience mathematical beauty. Now, for that, of course, you can't pick up people from the streets at night. You have to go to mathematicians. So it represents the extreme case of beauty, which is based on culture and learning. And so what you do is, uh, I, I must tell you that uh, the, I, my, my mathematician friends with whom I work, brilliant people, but they're very difficult in the sense that they say, oh, this equation is no good, and this equation has got too much physics, it's got too much chemistry, and so on and so forth. But anyway, we settled on 60 equations in the end and politely asked uh, graduates and postgraduates from the Department of Mathematics in London to study these equations at home for two weeks and then come back and review them in the, in the scanner and rate them. Well, they rated them before as well. And you find, I'm going to skip this. Um, it turns out that this, uh, actually, may I just go back because I, uh, I just want to point out that the, these are the, the, the the areas which are active during experience of the sublime which are distinct from the areas which are active when you experience the beautiful. Um, so this, uh, this equation, which is Leonard Euler's identity formula, which links five from the mental mathematical constants with three basic arithmetic operations, each occurring once. You notice I'm reading it because I'm not a mathematician. Um, uh, my, uh, one of my collaborators, Michael Atiyah, who's one of the most distinguished mathematicians in the world today, has described this as the mathematical equi equivalent of the soliloquy from Hamlet in its beauty. And this was given very, very high rating by m almost all the mathematicians. And the next one here, which is Ramanujan's, Ramanujan, the, 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 the great Indian mathematician who was picked up literally by Hardy and taken to Cambridge, uh, his equation expressing the inverse value of pi as an infinite sum was regarded by most as being a somewhat uh, ugly one. And if you look <clears throat> at the activity in the brains of uh, uh, mathematicians when they experience beauty in a mathematical equation, which, by the way, they describe as an emotional experience, uh, you find that the activity correlates with Sorry, the experience correlates with activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex, precisely the same area of the brain um, in which, uh, which correlates with, with the experience of, math of musical and visual beauty. Now, these are the facts. And now, if I may be allowed, I just want to speculate a bit 
<coughs> but not so much in my words, but in the words of the mathematicians. I'm averse to speculation because I'm a, I'm a scientist. Um, but speculation is really quite fundamental in science, too. So <coughs> I've said that I, the, the idea, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of, of uh, the, the experimental mathematics is really engaging. Uh, it is the most extreme form of beauty which is dependent on culture and learning. This is a fact, because you can't get people who are not mathematically educated to look at these equations, and that includes me, and experience the emotion of beauty. On the other hand, mathematical language is universal. So a Russian or an Indian or Chinese or an Englishman would all appreciate the mathematical beauty, even though they differ both racially and culturally. So there, it is not quite true to say that this is the most extreme form of, uh, of, uh, um, of beauty which is dependent on culture and learning. So what does mathematical beauty in particular and beauty in general tell us about the brain and tell us about the world in which the brain has developed? Paul Dirac, who was a, um, uh, a, a brilliant physicist, wrote, I'm quoting him not quite verbatim, but nearly so. He said that Einstein's theory of relativity imported beauty to an unprecedented extent into mathematics. And since that time, we have come to realize that when we decide the truth of a mathematical equation, we should no longer rely on its simplicity, but on its beauty. And he said that in all future studies that go by the beauty of a, um, a mathematical formula. And it is now evident that mathematicians rely uh, heavily on beauty because they say, this, I, this is not me, they, I'm quoting them, the beauty of an equation reveals to you fundamental truths about the, uh, about the world in which we have developed. Immanuel Kant raised the question of where does the origin of mathematical beauty, of the experience of mathematical beauty arise? He says it arises from the satisfaction of the logic of the brain. But the logic of the brain is really uh, the logic of an organ which has developed in this world. Now, if you look at um, uh, animals, and people have often taken examples of peacocks and their colors, or uh, bowbirds and their bowers, and said that this is, uh, represents beauty in the animal world, the question is not so much the coloring of the peacocks and the, uh, the architecture of the nest, but why these particular colors and why these particular forms? That is the question that we have to address. Now, I want to finally end up. So, 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 so the, the, the position taken by mathematicians today, and I'm half inclined to agree with them, but I don't, I'm not knowledgeable enough, is that the truth of an equation lies in its being perceived as beautiful because the beauty satisfies the inductive and deductive logic of the brain. That is their statement. Now I go to Hermann Weyl. Hermann Weyl was a brilliant uh, mathematician, one of the most brilliant of the last century. And he said, in my, I quote, quoting him, in my work, I always try to combine truth with beauty. But when I have to choose between the two, I always choose beauty. Now notice uh, that he is distinguishing, he is distinguishing between truth and beauty, whereas Dirac was not actually quite saying that. So Hermann Weyl wanted to reconcile the electromagnetism of James Clerk Maxwell with the uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And he worked for many years on a formulation, and at the end came up with a formulation which he thought was very beautiful, and he sent it to the journal of physics for, I think it was journal of physics, anyway, to a journal for publication, and the journal sent it to Einstein for review. Now, Einstein was very hostile. He said, this 
formulation goes against all known facts. Therefore, you cannot publish it. So they sent it back to Herman Weyl. He said, well, it may be against all known facts, but it is beautiful. So you should publish it. And in those days, before impact factors and citations and all of that, a wise editor said, all right, I'll publish it with, the, with an appendix giving all the objections of Einstein. So it was agreed. And then 10 years after the publication of this article, with the advent of quantum mechanics, which Einstein never believed in, it was found that Hermann Weyl's uh, formulations are all correct. And now it's republished without the objections of Einstein. So this is, in a, say, in a way, you might say, the triumph of beauty over truth. But in fact, if you look at what the mathematicians and the physicists are trying to tell us, is that there is no difference between the two. That one is a guide to the other, and one is a guide to the other because our brains have developed in a universe which has imposed a certain structure on it. And we recognize that structure uh, as beautiful because it satisfies the logic of our brain. Thank you. <laughs>